Hello, everyone, and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. I was expecting an intro, but never mind. Anyway, so before I begin with my reviews, I'm just going to give you my first segment, which is, as usual, what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. So this really doesn't come as any surprise to me, given the fact that last weekend was Halloween weekend, October 28th to 29th. But it's it does kind of surprise me because this is the seventh Saw movie. It is called Jigsaw, and it's kind of a prequel to the Saw movies. I'm not sure if anyone asked for it, but either way, there it is. And it earned $16.6 million against a budget of $10 million. Internationally, it has grossed $28 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit worldwide. Tyler Perry's Boo 2, A Medea Halloween, is number two at the box office this weekend, sliding one spot from last week where it debuted at number one. And it shows that actually the original Boo from last year, Boo A Medea Halloween, was actually number one at the box office for two weeks. So hopefully America has come to its senses. But anyway, Boo 2 grossed $10 million this past weekend, $10.1 mil, uh, $10 million. Um, actually, yeah, it grossed it this weekend against a budget of $25 million. Tyler Perry's Boo 2 A Medea Halloween gro has so far grossed $35.6 million here in the States and 35.7 million around the world. I'm not even sure if that's an international number, but basically ty uh, that title of that movie, which I won't say entirely, I'm just gonna say Boo 2 and just leave it at that. It is a tentative hit here in the States, worldwide, I don't know, probably not a certified hit because Tyler Perry has a lot more clout here in the States than he does worldwide, I can almost guarantee that. Geostorm is number three at the box office this weekend, sliding from number two last week, and it made $5.9 million this weekend. Against a budget of $120 million, Geostorm has only grossed $23.8 million here in the States, which means it's probably going to be, at least statewide, a box office bomb. However, around the world it has already grossed $137.5 million. So take that for what it's worth. Geostorm is not even close to being a hit here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit. Probably not going to be certified, but then again I could be wrong. Happy Death Day, I'm just going to tell you, it's certified here in the States and around the world. I know you're not waiting for those results with bated breath, but it's doing really well. Even though it fell from number three last week to number four this week, on a budget of $4.8 million, Happy Death Day has grossed $48.4 million here in the States so far, so more than 10 times its budget, and $68.6 .6 million around the world. This weekend alone, it grossed $5.1 million, which means it actually grossed more... It grossed over its budget this past weekend, so good for that movie. Blade Runner 2049 is still kind of struggling. Last week was number four, this week was number five. It's number five at the box office, having grossed $4.1 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $150 million, Blade Runner 2049 has so far grossed $81.5 million here in the States, and... $223.1 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, and it doesn't look very good for the movie in, in just four weeks. But around the world, it is a tentative hit so far. Thank You for Your Service is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week. This week, though, it it is number six amongst all the movies at the box office, having grossed just $3.8 million, and that's against a budget of $20 million. I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie, but I can tell you that Thank You For Your Service is not a hit yet here in the States, and not even close. Only the Brave debuted at number five at the box office last week. This week, it is number seven at the box office, so not a huge drop, but it did gross $3.5 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $38 million, Only the Brave has only grossed $12 million even at the U.S. box office. Like Thank You For Your Service, I don't have the international numbers for you for Thank You uh, For Only the Brave, but it is not a hit yet here in the States and is unlikely to even be a tentative hit worldwide if I even had those numbers. Number 
eight at the box office this weekend is The Foreigner, starring Jackie Chan, which fell from number six last week, having grossed $3.4 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $35 million, though, The Foreigner has so far grossed $29.1 million here in the States and $126.8 million worldwide, which means, strangely enough, it is not a hit yet here in the box office, uh, here in the States, but around the world, it is already a certified hit by quite a bit. Suburbicon is debuting this week at number nine. It's the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it debuted very, very low at the box office, having only grossed $2.8 million this past weekend in the States against a budget of $25 million. I do not also have the international numbers for you here, but I will tell you that Suburbicon has not even come close to grossing all its money back and will not very likely be in the top 10 this past weekend, or rather this this coming week, the next time I do my show. It's not looking very good for Suburbicon. I would not be surprised to see this out of the top 10 by next week. But this is one of the five movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show, and I will let you know exactly what I think about the movie when I get to reviewing it. And finally, number 10 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week, is It, or at least It Part 1, which grossed $2.5 million this past weekend, its eighth week in release. Against a budget of $35 million, it has so far grossed $323.9 million here in the States. And around the world, this is really freaky, it being Halloween weekend, and I am not making this up, I swear. It has so far grossed, around the world, $666.6 .6 million. That is crazy. It has grossed $6666 million. Now, would 6660 be as, as freaky? It might be, yeah, a little bit coincidental, but my God, the fact that it grows to, yeah, 666 is just mind-blowing, and I don't quite know what to say about those numbers. Listen, my life changed because someone was there to get me to use drugs. No one can understand. People think that having someone who will listen makes it better. I need help. I'm listening. I need help. I think that having someone who will listen makes it better. People understand. No one can get me to use drugs. My life changed because someone was there to listen. Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to turn addiction around. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on BostonFreeRadio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and it being fitting to review this movie after ha uh, Halloween weekend, the next movie I'm going to be, the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Jigsaw. This is the seventh Saw movie, but the first one that is a prequel. And I gotta tell you, 
I have not actually seen any of the Saw movies up to this point. I've seen clips of them. I've seen them parody to death. I know what they're about, but I haven't actually sat down and watched a Saw movie from beginning to end. But this is the, as I said, seventh Saw movie in 13 years, which means they've made a Saw movie every 22 months so far. And what I expected from Jigsaw is maybe a little bit more insight into the character of Jigsaw. Sort of how he was born, or not how he was born, his background, how he became a psychopath, and things like that. But uh, disappointingly, all I got from Jigsaw is that it is another Saw movie. That's pretty much it. You do get a little bit of background of the Jigsaw character, but basically, here's the synopsis of the Jigsaw movie. Bodies are turning up around the city, each having met a uniquely gruesome demise. As the investigation proceeds, evidence points to one suspect, John Kramer, the man known as Jigsaw, who has been dead for 10 years. So the fact that this guy, John Kramer, who is Jigsaw, has been dead for 10 years is a little bit fascinating, but as this case of how these murders are being committed is going on, all you get in the meantime, as the movie switches back and forth, is just another Jigsaw movie. Now, I can't say for sure, having not seen the other Jigsaw movies, if this is, in fact unique the the people who are being tortured and killed here are doing so in unique ways compared to the other saw movies but i doubt it there really is not a lot that is original about this movie and i've heard from some people who have seen the other saw movies that jigsaw is the best of the saw movies Again, I can't say because I haven't seen it, but I wouldn't doubt that. But at the same time, that's really not saying a lot for a franchise that it's really overstated its welcome. And very much like other horror movie franchises that, that somehow get fifth, sixth, seventh installments, it's just a franchise that is getting very, very old. And I really don't know when movie studios, particularly those that make horror movies, are ever going to learn. It's one thing if they make a horror movie that bombs. I mean, at least they made one and they could just forget about it. But when a horror movie succeeds, a movie like The Ring or Paranormal Activity or, God, name a horror movie, any, any one that's classic, they just have to keep regurgitating these sequels out over and over again. And then when Jigsaw has the chance to almost revitalize the the Saw franchise and maybe give a little bit more insight into John Kramer, it doesn't really do that. In fact, it took two directors to make this movie, Michael Spierig and Peter Spierig, who I assume are brothers, but I don't know for sure. But I don't know why it took one person to even direct. I don't even, excuse me, I don't know why it took two people to direct this movie. I don't know why that was necessary. In fact, I don't even know why it took people to direct this kind of movie. It just seems like all you just need are a couple of cameramen and just film the exact same things that were done, presumably, in the last three movies. So Jigsaw is a disappointment, not only because it's not scary, but also because it's not fun. You would expect Jigsaw being this... Well, you, you know Jigsaw is a human, but the, he has... A, a bit of a, a a MacGuffin in that creepy puppet with the with the actual with with targets on his cheeks. You would think that they do something with that. Well, like one thing I wanted to know is why that puppet. Obviously, the puppet is creepy, but was that a childhood plaything of John Kramer? In fact, what was John Kramer's childhood like? I mean, of course, a lot of sequels go through maybe more information than we need to know about some of the characters. Like, one of the biggest gripes about the Star Wars prequels was, I think as one commentator put it, and I can't remember their name, you have Star Wars being the best story about a man who walks into a bar ever. But then you have Star Wars Episode One and maybe even Episode Two about... The, the lease that was put on the bar, wh where the man came from, why he walked into the bar. I, th I think that's all well and good. So 
prequels can ruin a lot for the main franchise, but the truth of the matter is, Saw is so worn out as a franchise that it really doesn't have anything to lose. But it also doesn't even try to add anything new to the Saw franchise. As a matter of fact, I would have liked to maybe have seen Saw in space. Does it sound hokey? You bet your ass it does. But at least it's something new. I mean, having astronauts being tortured in space? My God, somebody get me an agent. I'm going to pitch this to the studios. This is something new with, with the Saw franchise. And yeah, not every thing that pulls a gimmick like that is going to work, but at least it's something new. So I think I've kind of beaten this to death, but you can just imagine what watching Jigsaw is like. In fact, there were times where during a movie where various people's deaths made me flinch, I actually nodded off during parts of the movie because I just didn't care. I didn't really care about the victims because I didn't know them. I didn't even have the slightest bit of sympathy or even empathy for John Kramer, even though... <laughs> the movie is supposed to be about him. So this Jigsaw just left me cold. It's a sequel that probably should have never been made. And if it, if it was going to be made, give me something new. I mean, already it says something that I had not seen any of the other Saw movies, but I get what they're about. I get that people are being tortured. I get they're, tr they're in this race for redemption. But that's all this movie gives us, just another Saw movie, which might as well have been called Saw 7. For that reason, Jigsaw gets my rating of a flunk out. It is a movie with a lot of missed opportunities, especially one for a prequel, and even if they had done stuff that might ruin the franchise, at least it would be something new. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Suburbicon. Suburbicon is the latest starring Matt Damon, Julianne Moore, and Oscar Isaac. It's directed by George Clooney, and the writers of the screenplay include Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers, and George Clooney and Grant Heslov. Now, one of the things that struck me interesting about Suburbicon when I saw the movie poster for it was that Joel and Ethan Cohen wrote the screenplay, but they didn't direct it. But after watching the movie, I think I probably know why, or at least I have one out of two reasons, or supposed reasons, maybe even conspiracy theories, about why Joel and Ethan Cohen didn't direct it. Either... It was a movie that did not live up to their storytelling standards, and they just passed it on to somebody else despite getting the screenplay sold, or probably even a, a more likely reason is that Joel and Ethan Cohen wrote the screenplay, then George Clooney and his writing partner Grant Heslov m made some edits and some tweaks to it, but then studio interference got in the way. So I think that second reason is probably the reason why Suburbicon definitely tries and certainly has people with acting chops to make this movie work, but for some reason it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, the, the tagline, of the, or rather the plot synopsis of the movie, according to IMDb, is a home invasion rattles a quiet family town. 
Well, the home invasion is just one aspect of this movie. It does take place in the suburbs. What town, what, out of what city and in what state, the movie never says. It's probably not in the South. But there are a couple of things going on. This quiet family town, the, the suburbs, does get rattled, by, or at least one family gets rattled by a home invasion, particularly the home of the main character of the movie, who's who's played by Matt Damon, and and also I just got a little bit. Uh, never mind. Also, his wife Rose, played by Julianne Moore, and Rose's twin sister Margaret also played by Julianne Moore. And the one thing about Julianne Moore's character in this movie is, I think it would have been okay to just have Julianne Moore play one character, but when in the very beginning of the movie, you could see her playing two characters. I get the fact that they're supposed to be twins, but what I don't understand is why Julianne Moore had to play two characters. Why couldn't they just have another lesser known actress who bears a familial resemblance to Julianne Moore. Instead, having Julianne Moore play two characters, I thought made the movie, right from the onset, a little hokier than it needed to be. There's also a subplot in the film, which you think is going to be the main focus of the film, where this movie takes place in 1959, and a black family, an African-American family, moves in to this neighborhood, very much upsetting the predominantly, almost exclusively, white people in the neighborhood. And there is one, there's one character who, who looks at the reaction of the white neighbors and thinks to themselves, or says to themselves out loud, wow, you would have expected something like this to happen in the South, but not here. But you don't exactly know where the, the movie takes place, and that's one of the first problems. But in addition to that, you have a, a mystery going on involving why was this home invaded? Why was this home in this particular suburb invaded and not any other home? Why did one person get killed during the invasion? I'm not gonna say who, and not anybody else. And why haven't the police found the people who invaded this home? But the, these, it, these subplots could have been woven together pretty well. The, the integration of the, the neighborhood and then this home invasion, but they're completely separate and they never quite mesh together. As I said, the, the acting in this film is pretty good, but at the same time, there, there, are, these, there are these subplots and this, this out of nowhere plot twist that tie together. And I'm not going to exactly spoil what happens because it, the, the, the plot twist is interesting, if not a little bit predictable, but the movie doesn't quite get that execution off the ground in terms of what all these stories have to do with one another. And of course, you could argue in life, yeah, there are separate things that happen in a neighborhood all the time. They don't necessarily have to relate to one another. But in a movie, it helps if they relate to one another, not if they're completely separate. So there are all these incidents going on. There are tensions. There's a, a pretty big climax that goes on. But when all is said and done, there are missed opportunities for some really big shockers in this film. And I'm just actually kind of blown away but by what opportunities this movie missed. And as I said, th there is this Hamlet-Shakespeare dynamic between Matt Damon and one of, one of his sisters-in-law. Th that's one of the big spoilers, but Again, I'm not going to spoil it any more than that, but there, there really isn't too much else to say about Suburbicon, only that it is a movie that severely lacked opportunities. Unfortunately, this does have the distinction of being George Clooney's worst film, and that's not like saying the worst Pixar film. This is George Clooney's worst film, which he's directed by a lot. And I think the reason is that it has a story that just doesn't have any focus and subplots just that just veer off in various directions. It doesn't work as a parody. It doesn't work as a mystery. It doesn't work as a movie about 
segregation and integration. It just doesn't work. And it's a movie that certainly tries, it looks good, but in the end, I have to give it my rating of a strikeout. It is probably George Clooney's biggest disappointment as a director. And I've seen him direct some great films, including Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Good Night and Good Luck, and, and the list goes on. But Suburbicon is a big miss. I think Joel and Ethan Cohen were wise enough to stay away from this as directors, or at least stay away from it when I think probably the studios interfered as much as they did. And yeah, I, I think studio interference is the big culprit here, but I am just guessing. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay, I just pop some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Every Monday night, tune in to the Misery of Cities from 8 to 9 for 40 years of lost psychedelic, krautrock, new wave, post-punk, indie, shoegaze. Found again and heard only on Boston Free Radio. Making Waves with Boston's All-Italian Language Program, featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui su bostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana di ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio or WBCA. You are watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV or some community radio station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast to them, I say, with my monkey mask, thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Thank You for Your Service, a movie about a group of U.S. soldiers who returned from Iraq in 2007 and struggled to integrate back into family and civilian life while living with the memory of a war that threatens to destroy them long after they've left the battlefield. This is a movie that is written and directed by Jason Hall, based on a book of the same name, based on a true story, by David Finkel. And this is a movie that I guess is a little timely. As a matter of fact, it's a movie for which I probably have greater hopes that people will see, especially considering that after The Hurt Locker, a lot of films about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been doing significantly better at the box office. During the actual war in Iraq about 10, 15 years ago, well, maybe not 15 years ago, but somewhere around there, movies about the Iraq war, including documentaries, were basically box office poison. And in fact, Jon Stewart made a joke at the 2006 Oscars saying, we must stay the course on these movies. But uh, again, that, that joke's dated, but it, it was funny when I first saw it. But anyway, Thank You for Your Service is a movie that does focus to a certain extent on the Iraq war, but it's not focused exclusively on life on the battlefield. But it tells you enough to show you how much the soldiers in this movie uh, who I believe are in the army, are struggling with civilian life after leaving and are also have various e extremities of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, I think that's actually good. They're, they show soldiers that have almost immediate post-traumatic stress disorder as soon as they land back in the States, but also ones who think they have it all together and eventually they find that they are seeing things and maybe even people that no one else is seeing and they find that when they go into a public place they might hear some noise that would bring them back to the battlefield in a really bad way of course i'm not sure if there's a good way but the main focus on this movie is a character by the name of adam schumann who is based on a real Iraq War veteran, I think of the same name, who's played in this movie by Miles Teller. 
His fellow comrades include a, a Samoan American who is also a, a, a soldier in the war and also another person who is about to get married only to find that he comes home and his, not only is his fiance gone, but also all their stuff uh, in the apartment. So he's living in an apartment without electricity or even a bed. So there are certain, there are certain extremities to which these soldiers come back after an 11th month deployment in Iraq. And one of the soldiers is actually considering going back to Iraq because he can't stand civilian life when, and I'm sure a lot of other soldiers would kill to have a, a civilian lifestyle. But anyway, the, the movie has, a, details a lot of the post-traumatic stress disorder with these soldiers, all of whom come home in one piece. They're, they're not missing limbs, they're not paralyzed, and that's good. But the psychological damage that is done to these soldiers really can't be stressed any further from this movie. And I also liked how the movie details the soldiers' relationships with their wives, their girlfriends, and sometimes even their kids. There are there some really shocking moments, and there were also moments that genuinely made me cry, especially with Miles Teller when he's actually uh, detailing the his war experiences with psychologists and also some other people who were deeply affected by the Iraq War, even if they weren't actually stationed in the Iraq War. One of the interesting characters in this movie, who I don't actually think was focused on enough, was a, a soldier's wife whose husband was killed in the Iraq War. The character's name is Amanda Doster, and she's played actually by Amy Schumer in Amy Schumer's first straight dramatic role. And I actually thought Amy Schumer did pretty well in this role. Again, it, d it did surprise me that she had absolutely no funny parts in this movie whatsoever, but she certainly has a, a flair for drama within her, and I'd like to see her in more dramatic things. In fact, I wanted to see her more in this movie, and I don't think the movie actually focused enough on her, but for for what they lacked in Amy Schumer's appearance, they actually made up for in really emphasizing, I, I, th I think, in a very accurate way, what post-traumatic stress disorder is like and what the soldiers who have experienced it and come back to civilian life actually experience. Now, I'm no psychologist. I also haven't served in the armed services, so I can't exactly say whether or not this movie is really accurate, but... I would be willing to bet that if I went to this movie with a veteran of any war, let alone Iraq or Afghanistan, I think they would probably tell me that this is pretty accurate if they can make it through the movie. But this movie certainly is probably one of the best depictions of PTSD I've seen since maybe Born on the Fourth of July from 1989, the movie starring Tom Cruise and directed by Oliver Stone, which is pretty underrated. Granted, it did show the war experience added to struggling with civilian life, let alone with somebody who is paralyzed, but I think Thank You for Your Service does well with the subject it's given. Miles Teller turns in his best performance since Whiplash, and it's a movie that gets a knockout in my book. There are some very sad parts. The violent parts will make you flinch, as well as some other parts that, would, that maybe aren't as violent, but certainly are as shocking. And I think, very much like American Sniper, you get a greater appreciation for what Iraq War veterans have gone through uh, leading up to this film. Jill, why don't you tell the class what you did this weekend? Well, my dad and I went in search of some magical minnows and found a zillion of them in the stream from our lookout rock. Then my sister and I escaped from an evil slug king and went back to my super twig fort for safety. Then we told stories till it got dark and the Big Dipper led us all the way home. Whoa. Where were you, Jill? We went to the forest. It's not that far away. Ask your parents to take you and your friends to the forest this week. It's closer than you think. Check out discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ag Council. <laughs> Freedom to soar with the hawks above Union Square. Boston, birthplace of revolution and complaint. Radio.
miniaturized to fit in the pocket of your overalls. Together they spell bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review is one that has not come out yet nationwide, but it is in select theaters, including, thankfully, one theater in Boston. The movie is called Wonderstruck. It's from director Todd Haynes, who has actually brought us a number of... Uh, a variety of movies, including Far From Heaven from 2002, starring Julianne Moore, I'm Not There from 2007, which is the unorthodox Bob Dylan biopic where Christian Bale, Kate Blanchett, Heath Ledger, Richard Gere, and two other actors actually play Bob Dylan in a variety of his various stages in his life and career. And also his most recent film is Carol, which came out two years ago and starred Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. And Todd Haynes, what's interesting about Todd Haynes is he directed Rooney Mara to her best performance to date. Maybe if you don't include a ghost story, but yeah, I, I thought Carol was certainly a, a pleasant surprise for, for me from Rooney Mara, who I've been kind of wishy-washy on in terms of her acting skills. But Wonderstruck is Todd Haynes' first family movie. It's rated PG, and it's based on a book by Brian Selznick, who brought us actually such young adult fiction as the, well, the, the movie Hugo, what, what, what what's actually based on a book titled The Something of Hugo Cabaret. I, I'm, I don't have the name for you right there, but Wonderstruck is not quite as science fiction-y as Hugo, but it's still an intriguing story nonetheless. It's the story of a young boy in the Midwest, and it's told simultaneously with a tale about a young girl in New York from a, a distance of 50 years. In other words, the girl lives in 1927, and the boy lives in 1977, so there's a 50-year gap there, as they both seek the same mysterious connection. So anyone who has read the book Wonderstruck, which Brian Selznick wrote, might will probably not be surprised what the connection is. But for people who haven't read that book, like me, I, I think the movie does well bringing you along with these two characters and as they're their stories and their points of view switch from side to side and from viewpoint to viewpoint, you're watching this movie and you're wondering, what is the connection between these two? The young boy lives in Minnesota and the young girl is from, is from uh, New Jersey. I, I want to say Hoboken, New Jersey, but don't quote me on that. But the two of them are going to New York City for different reasons. And you're not sure exact, well, you are sure exactly why. Both of them are seeking family, but besides that, is it just that these two from people from 50 years apart are seeking the same thing, which is what connects them, or is there something else as well? Now, considering that this movie is going to come out on November 10th nationwide, I definitely will not spoil for you 
what these two are looking for and what the connection is between these two. I will tell you, however, that this is the first movie I've seen in 10 years where I was completely immersed in the movie, and when it ended, I was actually really disappointed that it ended, despite the fact that two hours had gone by already. I, I was just, when the, when the end credits rolled, I just thought to myself, my God, that's it? And not in a bad way, mind you. The last movie that I felt that way towards was No Country for Old Men. No Country for Old Men ended on a very questionable and ambiguous note, but at first I was struck that the movie would end in this way, but as I left the theater and I thought back on the movie and the journey that I just witnessed, the movie stayed with me in kind of the same way that, but for different neat reasons, that No Country for Old Men stayed with me. And the, the fact that this movie had that effect on me is probably going to mean that it might have the same effect on you or any children who watch this movie when, when they get to see it. And I, I just thought it had great cinematography. I like the contrast between the quote-unquote present day that the young boy experiences and the, the, the past that the girl experiences. And it also focuses on characters who are deaf. Um, the, the girl is born deaf, and the boy actually becomes deaf after an accident. Both of them are around the same age, probably about 9 or 10. And the difference being that the, the boy, very much like Beethoven, wasn't born deaf, so he can still understand it when, when people write things down, but he can't understand sign language, whereas the girl is, can also understand things that are written, but she is probably more attuned to her deafness than the boy is. So there's that contrast right there. And there are also some great supporting appearances in this movie, especially from Julianne Moore. And even though Julianne Moore turned in a less than stellar performance in Suburbicon, as luck would have it, she would have another film that comes out the same year, to me it's the same week, where she more than redeems herself for the weaknesses in Suburbicon. And admittedly, she wasn't the worst thing about Suburbicon. I don't think any of the actors were, but this is, Wonderstruck is a movie that has one up on Suburbicon in the sense that it tells a more focused and linear story where the subplots actually do tie together and in a way that you would not expect to find. As a matter of fact, there's one quote in the movie that's actually written down on a piece of paper that I think I probably will spoil for you. It's one that the boy reads where it's, it's one that his late mother actually cut out and put on a mirror. It's, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And the quote does not reappear after the boy reads it, but it does reappear visually. In other words, he doesn't pick up the piece of paper again and read it, but you're immediately reminded of it come the end of the movie. That's all I'm gonna say about Wonderstruck without ruining it. It is a knockout. I think it's one of the best films to come out this year. It's certainly well-timed for the coming Oscar season, and I think anyone of any age who watches this movie will love it. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. I love the Six sun. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blown neurotic toe. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on our property music. 
Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is 7852. This is a documentary about the unprecedented, iconic shower scene in Alfred Hitchcock's classic movie, Psycho. And it's about the man behind the curtain, quote unquote, and the sc the screen incident, I'm not going to say what kind of incident, that profoundly changed the course of world cinema. It's directed and, I guess you could say, written by Alexander O. Philippe, who is a French documentary filmmaker who has brought us such documentaries as The Life and Times of Paul the Psychic Octopus, The People vs. George Lucas, and Doc, that is documentary, of the dead. So this... This director, Mr. Philippe, has not directed actually a feature film, but this probably could be his best documentary to date. So it has to do with the shower scene and Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, but what do the numbers 78 and 52 mean? Well, you know when you, when you watch the film what they mean, or at least you're, you're given a, a very brief description, but let me tell you what it means. So the shower scene in Psycho consisted of 78 camera setups and 52 cuts. It's a scene that only lasts about 45 seconds, but it had 78 camera setups and 52 cuts. Did it take a long time to film? You bet your ass it did. It actually took seven days to film. And this movie gets into probably the cultural significance of Psycho, what what Alfred Hitchcock's films before that were like and how that psycho differentiated and probably it gets into the I mean not probably it does get into how significant the shower scene in psycho is not and in addition to how it was filmed and I, I actually being a cinephile found it incredibly fascinating I do have to say that unfortunately even though I have seen psycho Probably the downside of this scene being so iconic is the fact that it has been parodied over and over again in various movies and TV shows. In fact, the, the clips that they show in this movie of the movies and TV shows in which they parody this, this scene doesn't even cover half of the parodies, but it covers probably the funniest ones. But the downside of that is this scene, which is very significant for the movie and for movies of its time, really <laughs> has been parodied so much that more people know about this scene than perhaps they should. In fact, people who have not even seen the movie Psycho know this scene. But what's significant about it is the, the shower scene involved Janet Lee, who was the, the, the star of the movie, and the the hero, and the, the, the fact that she meets her fate, I know I ruined it right there, but go along with me. The, the lead actor was never, or at least very, very rarely, killed off in the middle of the movie. <laughs> so I, I guess I, I ruined it for you there. I mean, now it's, it's a little unusual, but this is back in 1960. This never happened. If somebody was the lead actor or lead actress in a movie, basically you could assume that they would still be alive by the time the credits would roll. Or at least they wouldn't be, they would meet their fate so quickly into the movie. But that's exactly what happens here. But the fate of the, one of the main characters in this film is not what makes this scene significant, or at least not entirely. What also makes it significant is that it is really really terrifying it the the 78 camera angles and 52 takes really made the scene look frantic and scary and the movie also delves into really well some of the the the, the sound effects that were made how they were made and i, I won't exactly spoil it, it, how they were made but it's it's really fascinating to see the the reenactments and also, the fact that this movie was filmed entirely, the documentary filmed entirely in black and white, adds to its dedication and its tribute to 
the, the movie Psycho as a whole. It does add some color clips in there, but mainly of the archive footage, just to prove a point. But the interviews are done in black and white, and the, the roster of people they got for interviews is really profound. They have Hitchcock admirers like director Peter Bogdanovich and Danny Elfman, uh, as well as author Brett Easton Ellis, it has people who were related to Janet Lee, like her daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis. And it also has some of the people who were involved in the, the making of the, the psycho shower scene, including a Playboy bunny, Marley Renfro, who actually served as a body double for that scene for Janet Lee. Uh, unlike Janet Lee, she's still alive today and was actually probably one of the key interviewees in this documentary. So if you love horror films and who doesn't around Halloween, and if you love Alfred Hitchcock, or if you're basically a cinephile who has an appreciation for complex scenes like this, you will love 7852. I know I certainly did. And while it's a little too early to give you my rating, I think it's already apparent that my rating of this film is a knockout. And I would love to see this movie get nominated for Best Documentary. Granted, a number of documentaries that I thought were worthy of being nominated for Oscars actually weren't, particularly those when it came to film. Like, for instance, the Roger Ebert documentary Life Itself, directed by Stephen James, I was actually very surprised to see was not nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary. There was also one that came out that exact same year about the greatest movie never made, which was... Hodorowski's Dune, which was an adaptation of the movie, or the book Dune, which was going to be directed by Alejandro Hodorowski, but ultimately ended up being shelved indefinitely. But it was fascinating, that movie, to see what the movie was potentially going to be like, how far it had gone in production. And I think 7852 has the same kind of allure as the movie Hodorowski's Dune. I can't guarantee whether or not this will be nominated for Best Documentary, but I can guarantee if you see this movie, you will love it. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. <laughs> the dad joke. Corny, groan-worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. So take a moment to make your kid laugh, because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion... Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've re reviewed the five movies that I'm going to review for this show, it's now time for me to get into my next segment, which is what's coming out next. This is a spoken word section of the show where I give you my I just screwed that up but let me let me say that again this is the spoken word set where I give you a damn it this is this is where I give you the spoken word preview of what's movies are coming out this coming weekend there I said it so the biggest movie that's coming out this coming weekend is the movie Thor Ragnarok Ragnarok I don't know what Ragnarok is, but people who have read the Thor comics probably already know that. But this is the third Thor movie, but it is the second Thor movie to come out after the Avengers, or the first Avengers film. And so this is a movie which has Thor imprisoned, and he, must, and he finds himself in a lethal gladiatorial contest against the Hulk, his former ally, which explains how Thor and and the Hulk were not in Captain America Civil War and engaging in the Civil War between Captain America and Iron Man. Well, it turns out they actually are having a Civil War on their own. 
So Thor must fight for survival and race against time to prevent the all-powerful Hela from destroying his home and the Asgardian civilization. Sounds like there's a lot going on here, but Chris Hemsworth returns as Thor. Tom Hiddleston returns as Loki. We also have Kate Blanchett, Mark Ruffalo making his first non-Avengers appearance as the Hulk. So this movie looks like it should be very entertaining. And of course, it is a lead in into the third Avengers movie where the Avengers team together and battle Thanos, which is coming out, I believe, next summer. So even though I have not seen the first two Thor movies, I still think I probably won't be lost if I see this film because I have seen both Avengers movies, probably every Marvel film in the Marvel Comics universe, except for those Thor movies. I know it's a crime, but I will see Thor Rag Ragnarok. And that's a bit of a mouthful right there. And I will let you know what I think next week. Another movie that's coming out is a, I guess, marginally anticipated sequel, which is A Bad Mom's Christmas. This is the sequel to Bad Moms from two years ago, which I didn't think was a particularly great film. As a matter of fact, I gave it my rating of a strikeout when I first reviewed it, but it did well enough to merit a sequel. And this time, A Bad Mom's Christmas follows our three underappreciated and overburdened women as they rebel against the challenges and expectations of the Super Bowl for Moms Christmas. So this movie has Mila Kunis, Kristen Bell, and Katherine Hahn coming back as the aforementioned Bad Moms, in addition to women who are actually going to play their moms, particularly Cheryl Hines, who I think is playing Kristen Bell's mom, Susan Sarandon, who's playing Katherine Hahn's mom, and Christine Baranski, who's playing Mila Kunis's mom. I don't have high expectations for this movie, but... I have seen the original Bad Moms, and I'm going to see this one because I'm doing this for you guys. It's all for you. I really have no interest in seeing this. I don't have particularly high expectations, but it's not only coming out this weekend, but it's coming out tomorrow. So this is probably a film I'm just going to see and just get it over with. So I'm probably not going to like this film if I do like it, whether or not I do, I'll let you know next week. But heads up, I'm probably going to dislike this movie. Just, same thing with Boo 2 and Medea Halloween. Why was I subjected to that? Because it was out in theaters. So the other movies that are coming out besides A Bad Mom's Christmas and Thor Ragnarok, and I said it right this time, are films that are coming out in limited release, including Last Flag Flying, which is about a former Na Navy Corpsman named Larry Doc Shepard who reunites with his old buddies 30 years after they served together in Vietnam and they are coming together to bury their son, a young Marine killed in the Iraq War. This one's directed by Richard Linklater, his first film since Everybody Wants Some. So this is much more serious than Everybody Wants Some. Hopefully it's as good, though. It stars Brian Cranston, Lawrence Fishburne, and Steve Carell. Like, not people who are of Vietnam War age, but this movie probably takes place 10 years ago, very similar to Thank You for Your Service. But it looks great in terms of its premise. Hopefully, it's coming out in a theater near me. If it is, I'll see it, and I'll let you know what I think next week. But anyway, that just about does it for Words on Film for this show, for this week. I'm Dan Burke, your host and movie critic, reminding you that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any employees working for the station airing this broadcast, or the station as a whole. So thank you so much for tuning in to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies, and until next time...